uh, putting it in relation to human activities and in politics as well. Uh, when I worked in Idaho, I was a, my title was a regional conservation educator, so I did a lot of work, of course, with teachers and programs, but also I worked a lot with the media, so I was trying to educate the media to help educate the public <coughs> what we were uh, trying to get the message across. And unfortunately today, I can say that the, our department, while Idaho Fish and Game does some great things when it comes to education, it pales what I see Michigan doing here. So I'm really impressed with what Michigan's got going, and uh, I wish Idaho would go down that road, but I know they decided to go a totally different way back to the future. So um, this is why I'm, I guess, you know, today I'm an environmental science educator as part of the Fulbright program. I'm a Fulbright specialist. Uh, I've gone, uh, I just got back from another uh, project in Europe. And there again, I work primarily with bears, but also talking about the North American model of conservation, and then also about just uh, other activities related to, to modern game management in North America versus the European model. While I was here in my career, I spent a lot of time with Project Wild. Uh, raise your hand if you were a Project Wild teacher. You. Uh, we're going to do an activity at the end that kind of wraps up a lot of what I talked about here. It was one of a, a Project Wild, one of the, we would call the flagship activities that, is, that focuses on salmon and was actually put together by one of uh, Kevin's predecessors, who was the instrumental in the, in the creation of Project Wild. Um, and then, uh, like I say, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to see what I'm talking about in that activity. And then, as I mentioned along the way, I was heavily involved with grizzly bear recovery, both the Yellowstone ecosystem and as part of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. So again, lots of bear work. And I still work with the Slovak Wildlife Society uh, as far as working on uh, human bear conflicts in, in, in Slovakia right now. So I'll be heading back there next month to help with some work there. Um, but as someone was saying here, bears eat salmon. So for me, you know, I've always, I'm lately I'm the bear guy, but I am going to try to strip back to my early days. And go back to my, I got a salmon shirt on here. So this guy's scary. Yeah. I know. <laughs> There's my salmon shirt, so I'm going to be a salmon guy right now. So, uh, anyway, so again, there is that interrelationship between bears and, and salmon, but also, of course, people and salmon. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about as we go through this. Uh, one thing I always like to point out, you know, I'm a bear guy, but I always use Smokey to put up my all-purpose disclaimer that I'm here and not talking for Idaho, I'm not talking for Michigan, I'm talking for me as an educator. And so what I say might sometimes conflict with the agencies that I'm related to might say, but that's just my, my disclaimer. All right, and I know Kevin loves quotes from uh, Aldo Leopold, so, and, and but this is, again, just a second of a quote of Leopold's, but it really pertains to Sam, because uh, you know, who but a fool with his card seemingly uses parts of every cod and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent teaching. When it came to Sam in the Pacific Northwest, they just chucked him under the bus. Okay, It wasn't like, we really need to be smart about how we're going to develop the, the resources of the Northwest. Uh, we're just going to do it. And, and in the process, they pretty much tossed the salmon. And, and now they're fighting to keep it from, uh, from totally uh, disappearing. And I know we use the term extirpate versus extinct. Well, even though there are sockeye salmon and Chinook salmon elsewhere on the planet, those native species that are there are listed as threatened and endangered species because they risk going extinct because they are uniquely different. Uh, you can you can take a salmon from a sockeye from Alaska, bring it down to Idaho, and it just won't. Same size fish, same weight, doesn't have the same DNA switches in its, in its makeup to work. So again, they, they truly are a unique species, and when they're gone, they're gone. So we try to learn how to monkey the genetics of fish, which is probably not that far away, but it's not scary. Uh, and when I call this a slow motion crisis, I love this. As I was putting this together, I found this book, The Salmon Crisis, well, 1951. So here we are. 68 years later, and we're still fighting the same battles and not much success. One thing we did do was make a three cent stamp that was about, <laughs> uh, that about wildlife conservation. Uh, that was three years after that book, but so maybe that was our, our, our fix. Making a stamp. But really, when, again, when I start to show you how it's unraveled, you, you'll start to understand that it's, not that it's a conspiracy, but it's almost like somebody's trying not to fix the problems. There's no problems are. Um, so a little bit, um, hopefully this will work, because I did embed it as a background while I'm talking. Um, you know, 
the, the fish that we're talking about are anadromous, which anadromous in Greek means to run up. Okay, so these fish run up uh, from the ocean. And um, Idaho, I'm going to explain how unique it is because of where we are in the, in, in the system. Uh, the, uh, and these fish, of course, uh, are part of what we call the Pacific Northwest, the Columbia Basin system. So I'm not talking about Canadian salmon or Alaskan salmon or Oregon or California. Those are all uh, separate, you know, uh, species, separate uh, strains and have uh, unique challenges. But as far as the ones that are in Idaho, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. And uh, there's four four salmonids that we have that are that were part of the system. Uh, one I can only find the, the, the bright version of it, but we have the Chinook, the coho, the sockeye, and then the steelhead. So those were the native uh, anadromous fish there. Um, uh, and uh, I'll talk about. Them how they fit in historically and where they're at today. Here's, uh, you know, the, the, the Columbia River Basin that hooks into the Snake River, which hooks into Idaho, and the Sand River's in there as well. I, I live and work in this area here from Idaho Falls. Yellowstone is right there. And I mentioned to folks that 1% of Yellowstone is in Idaho. That was in our region. So we got to work in Yellowstone. Uh, so this is, again, the territory that we're, we're talking about the anadromous fish. And it used to go even further. There were fish runs before they were blocked that went down into Nevada. So that would have been the longest running uh, anadromous uh, in the world. And as of today, with the 900 mile run from the ocean to, uh, to the Stanley Basin, is the longest anadromous run that's out there. So, again, uh, a lot of distance to cover. And one thing to keep in mind is when we start talking salmon numbers, is that historically, <laughs> rounding it all up, the average. The average return uh, on, the, on the salmon, you know, once the ocean came back was, was, was 5% was dead, was the max average. Okay, so 5%, you know, of whatever headed to the ocean came back, and that was in the good old days, before man got involved. So we'll talk, show you some numbers from the current kind of goals that we have and how we're dismally failing. But even again, at 5%, there were millions and millions of fish that came back. And, uh, and so... Uh, system was designed to feed the whole the whole region and it did a really good job of that and uh, now again when we take out all that that, that biomass will be back and forth there's a not just the salmon that are at risk but a lot of other things um so you know here's the columbia the columbia river and the snake river we start to look at uh some numbers we have uh this is what they used to be those are the salmon returns pretty pretty uh, modern times. So we're talking, and again, remember that those returns are only about 5% of what was going to the ocean. So they were coming back in these kind of numbers once upon a time. And then I'll, I'll down the line here, I'll show you what they are today. And it's, uh, it's just dropped a million off almost. We have just 10 to 16 coming back. I mean, it's, it's that ridiculous. Uh, there were some natural barriers along the way. This is uh, Shoshone Falls in near Twin Falls, Idaho. This, uh, there is a power plant on it, but it's even pre, again, pre development times. This was the fish passage barrier that they, the, the, the salmon could never get over. So, anything above this, uh, with, there were no salmon. We had the Yellowstone cutthroat trout, which is above this, which is a, another species that's a, a risk. But below this is where the salmon came to. And, and right before this, they actually would take a, a left turn and head to Nevada. This is a uh, Salmon Creek Falls, and not exactly what you think of as far as salmon habitat, <laughs> but historically they lived there. They, they made it there, and, and, and there was enough um, moisture in the spring that could, could flush them out to the ocean, and they would come back to spawn there years later. So, again, salmon are pretty incredible critters if you let them be themselves, but we just couldn't seem to let them be themselves. I'll talk about that. Uh, you know, the Native Americans course existed for you know centuries with them without any issues uh, but of course it was pretty low tech and so their, their impact was pretty minimal uh, now as we work towards recovery uh, part of my work when I was up there was working with a group called the Columbia River Intertribal uh, Fish Commission and these were the major um, tribes that were involved in that recovery effort and still are and when it comes to actually getting something done they're the ones that can make it happen because they're separate nations not Idaho or not Washington or not Oregon, we're just states. These folks have a, a, a better seat at the table, uh, and, and so they're the ones who really push on the shove of salmon 
it's the tribes that have been able to make the difference as far as politically. Now, as far as biology and science, the, the states and the feds, we've done a great job with the hatchery aspect. That's not even the thing I'm going to get into because there's a lot of folks that are not happy with our hatcheries because they're too successful in the whole threat of competition from a hatchery fish to the wild fish. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of moving parts in it. But the tribe is definitely in, engaged um, you know, because they have a, a strong historical tie to the salmon. And in Idaho, I don't know a lot here in this part of the world, you know, Lewis and Clark were a big deal. You know, when we, we teach Idaho history, fourth grade required, uh, we have a big Lewis and Clark unit, and the salmon are part of that unit because they were so integral to the to, to the core of uh, discovery going through. Um, as far as like the natives, this is on uh, the Columbia River. This is a, a falls that been inundated. It's called Salila Falls, and uh, Randy was talking today about the net where he stuck it down. Well, these guys are hanging out. I mean, these are about the rickiest platforms you could ever want. And these are super long poles, which is pieces of like, basically rebar made into huge hoop nets. And they're just trying to grab the salmon as they're blowing by. Uh, and this was all flooded when they when one of the dams went in. And so we're going to talk a, a little bit about the dams as far as uh, why they were put in and then the impacts that they had. But this was, you know, for hundreds of years, this went on maybe not with nice pieces of lumber, but with, with you know, uh, logs and, and branches tied together. And these guys were hanging out there. You know, spearing and, and netting salmon, you know, so it's part of their part of their way of life. And so when Lewis and Clark came through, you know, this is all new to us European Westerners, and so they uh, had a chance to, to, to see how it all worked. You know, and of course they're using the water as their major method of navigation, and so they came across the various tribes that, in some of them, were you know used uh, salmon as part of their their, their food base. And uh, it's great to read some of the quotes. Uh, this top one there uh, talks about how. Uh, you know, they, they couldn't eat the fresh salmon because they were now away from the river, so they ate some of the dried salmon. But when you start reading it, uh, it produced the uh, same effect as well, which also, um, well, basically gave them the rights. <laughs> a horrible, horrible wind, and uh, and, and, and the animals that in many cases were incapacitated by the diarrhea, but uh, it was from the salmon that were, had the things growing on it. <clears throat> and then as they moved down the river again, they got towards the ocean, and they just saw all these spawned out salmon, but they didn't, the Indian, of course, the Native Americans didn't understand the biology that was going on, and they were trying to communicate in sign language and other things, and they never really could figure out why all, there was all these dead fish. They just knew there was tons of dead fish around, and, uh, and most of them, they, they couldn't eat, but some they did eat because they were you know, freshly dead, but um, they, they didn't find the, the runs right to see a lot of the returning fish, but they didn't see the aftermath of the spawn. So they knew that, you know, the Indians, the Americans, this has been a big part of their life, and, uh, and that there was a lot of uh, potential for commerce there. So as uh, you know, Lewis and Clark came back and the Pacific Northwest was, was developed, you know, the, 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 the fisheries were discovered. And so to the point where, you know, they're hauling fish in, you know, same netting right out the beach and all these different types of bailing nets that are out there. Uh, this is a wheel, a uh, fish wheel, and these were like basically you know, fish barges that were out there just in the, in the current, just collecting fish. And so we did a really good job in the early days of trying to, to, to extract as much as we could from that from that resource because, again, they're just going to die. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, at first we were just doing, you know, a drying method similar to what the natives had used. And then in time it became, you know, canning. And, you know, to get an idea, I mean, that's a human uh, stacks of, of canned salmon there. So again, we were extracting lots of salmon from that system, and unfortunately, these were all again start thinking about it. These were pre-spawners, probably. So you're talking about taking a lot off the top right there when you figure how many thousands of eggs each each fish would have had. So early on, we probably didn't think we were making kind of impact because the dams weren't built in, but we were having like say a, that was the start to get things to unravel right there. It was just our early exploitation of a resource that we thought was endless. Again, it wasn't that we were intentionally trying to wipe them out, not like the bison, which was, again, it was an intentional move against Native Americans, but in this case, we're talking about something we did just to be caught, hey, there's, there's a lot of people around. But that wasn't true. And so we started talking again about those four species that were there. This is the state of them today. Uh, or, or, you know, 86, the coho were extirpated, they're gone. There are no native left in the system. Where you guys saw that we had these transplanted populations here. Um, 
then uh, sockeye, we'll talk about the sockeye, the sockeye here in a second, they were listed, the Chinook salmon were listed in 92, and then even our steelhead were listed in 1997. So of all those four fish I showed you, the four native species, all one's gone and the other three are in trouble. And so we'll talk about what happened there and, uh, and what was being done or not being done. And so we're gonna kind of move up the river in a sec here, but first talk historically about the, what, what happened as far as development. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to run this, but if you went to this, this YouTube, this is an incredible um, PowerPoint presentation that runs from pre dams all the way up until today. And the important thing, though, is to see that there's these four dams that were on the lower Columbia. And those were the first dams that were put in for power, for hydro generation. And those, a lot of those dams, when they were built, did not even think, even though people knew fish were coming back, they had no bypass built in at all. It was like, oh, we built a dam. Maybe we should do a bypass now. It wasn't part of the original plan. And so literally some of these dams, the, 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 the fish ladders or the, the, by, the bypass, literally is in stairwells. They took a stairwell that was built into the dam and somehow connected that stairwell to below, you know, outdoors so fish could go in the stairs and literally swim up the stairs to get out. I mean, it was just crazy. It wasn't engineered at all. And along the way, we did a lot of engineering. And uh, the thing that people always focus on with the fish is the coming back. But I'll talk a little bit more about the real problem is the going. Okay, people always want to focus because it's such a cool thing about the fish jumping up over the falls or up the fish ladders. But it's really that downstream out migration that's the kicker. But for even though these four dams went into place during the, the early 30s and 40s, uh, fish numbers dropped, but not to the point of alarm. And I'll show you some numbers here in a sec that to, to illustrate that. It wasn't until we built the four what we call lower snake dams later on that the real problem started. So uh, there's a place in Idaho called Redfish Lake, and the Redfish Lake was named Redfish Lake not just because it had the sockeye come back, but because the whole lake just glimmered in red when they were back. There's so many of them, and, uh, uh, and and that was you know incredible that they were doing that. And at one point though because this is the heart of Idaho, which has a lot of mineral wealth, uh, and someone decided it would be a really good idea to build uh, a dam on the Salmon River right, right uh, below this before you get to, to uh, Redfish Lake. And so uh, again, here's Redfish Lake, here's all the dams. And what happened was they put this dam in here called Sunday Dam. And I'll show you a chart here of what happened to the fish runs. And so we took a sockeye that was, you know, an ocean-going fish, and Landlock it, so it didn't come. Kokanee, oh, right? So they were Kokanee, uh, and and that lasted until uh, somewhere down the line. And I'll show you here in a sec. They decided that they need to blow the dam, and this is the blow the dam today. Um, and so here's the numbers: how uh, it, uh, there was like nothing there. Okay, they had the dam in there. There was literally no no fish movement at all. And then the dam gets blown. Boom! It shoots up to five thousand fish. And then we built some other dams, the lower snake dams, and it drops off. I'll show you where it ended up. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So we had a residual population, resident population, below the dam, shoots up like that, and then we built these other dams farther down in the snake, and the numbers just drop off. And along the way, we did other fun things. Like, this is not a building, this is a dredge. The idea, I mean, it's massive. This is the man before. Which is right there at Sunbeam Dam, and some of the water was diverted to help move this monster down the, down the, the valley. And what it did was it just ground up literally the whole valley as it went. And of course, this is all spawning habitat for salmon. Okay. And, uh, and so this thing just chews up all this prime spawning habitat, uh, and then you know you get the score that you want to extract, and you know, they didn't know what to use in those days to well, still do to extract mercury or cyanide. Yeah. So. Again, we're using these chem nasty chemicals right above the main salmon to do this work, and uh, yet the fish are persevering once we remove the sun came down. But we got to that point where in the 90s we had one fish come back to uh, to Redfish Lake. And this guy here, that's him, Lonesome Larry was his name. <laughs> and uh, Lonesome Larry came back, and there was nobody there to meet him. And most of us know our biology enough well enough to know that. You these sockeye need to have both a male and a female to, uh, to keep the numbers going. And so they did uh, 
unceremoniously milk Larry for all of his work, so to speak. And from there, uh, there is a great, like, say, if you're a teacher doing activities on, on um, Lewis and Clark, but also Sam and Redfish Lake, if you go to that website there, then there's a whole unit and all kinds of related activities to Lonesome Larry uh, and whole flight of the sockeye salmon uh, in Redfish Lake. So needless to say, Redfish Lake uh, barely had any redfish in it anymore. And one thing that people just, again, at first didn't appreciate was the value of that biomass coming back to the, the Stanley Basin. Um, these fish, like I say, we all know, they, they come back and then they die. Okay? Uh, and so they spawn, they die, and they add the nutrients. It got to the point where Redfish Lake, and it still is close to that point, is pretty much a sterile lake. It, it doesn't have nutrients to keep any kind of aquatic food chain going. And, and, and so uh, what nature was able to do for centuries, you know, we destroyed and really haven't been able to fix yet. So um, even though I'll show you some numbers that are coming back, uh, that they're not they're feel-good numbers from a biological standpoint, they're no real significance. So, Larry even has his own beer here, Sockeye Lager in Idaho, Boise. It's most of Larry Lager there, so you can drink that beer at Larry. And this is actually a Sockeye costume that has a mascot that kind of makes appearances everywhere in Boise. It's kind of fun. But again, you know, to think that you could have a species that could almost literally take down to nothing and then try to bring it back, you know, that's what we can think, you know. I love Randy's talk this morning about that. That rabbit hole you go down when you try biologically to start fixing things. And, uh, and it, it's incredible to hear where things have gone or are going with them. Um, so, again, we've got these four things here that were original, had an impact, they did hook up bypasses and fish ladders. And then these other dams went in here that were pretty much uh, the, the cause of the problem. And these dams <laughs> were not put in for none of these are flood control dams, they were put in order to generate hydro. And, uh, and then um, also for barging, we'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, again, there's our, our sockeye there, numbers there. And uh, the thing that we want to look at here is, you know, today, the sockeye coming in the red jelly are, are hatching fish. And uh, not, they're not wild fish, or are using natural fish. We'll get to that in a second. So these are those dams that were put in that were, uh, um, you know, the first ones were put in for the war effort. Okay, we needed the first lower, the lower Columbia dams were put in uh, their project between Bonneville Power, U.S. Uh, Bureau of Rec and Army Corps of Engineers, which is a whole weird relationship. Um, but it was something that needed to be done to develop the hydro of the Northwest. And the reason we needed it was World War II. Okay, those dams were built in the lower on the Columbia so we could have more, more bombers and more planes than the Axis powers. Simple. And that's what we needed for, it. and again, it was it was important at that time. But after the war, rather than decommissioning those dams, we built war dams, we built those other dams, and that's where we started creating this kind of problem of uh, the, the 4-H problem. It's they call it both the problem and the solution. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I go along here. Um, the problem we have, of course, with the, with the fish is that uh, you know the dams were built again to generate power. So any water that doesn't go through a turbine is money down the toilet. So and so, uh, what we do know though, over time is that if you take, if you have enough water and you put it over the top, those fish will live. Okay? Now, when I worked up there uh, in the early years, there was all kinds of studies showing that the fish would get, would get basically the bends and die. Well, the studies are being done with fish that were being basically kept in cages at the bottom of the of, of the spill, so which is not a natural thing. Fish would be over the top just to keep heading south. So these fish were were, were dying of the bends, but it's because they were being basically Know, held under the, the flow uh, longer than natural. But again, the companies did not want to let the battle power, did not want to let the water go over the top because it's lost money. So they spent millions and millions of dollars and all kinds of weird bypass systems, little skimmers that had like saran wrap basically that would kind of push the fish this way. And it, it was just, again, it was like an engineer's dream to get an almost unlimited money to try to make a, a solution that really wasn't possible. So uh, the numbers uh, that were moved in the bypass system were just ridiculous. One of the, uh, you know, and we're talking again about those smolts, okay? They, they've been in the gravels, 
down into the ocean. And in the old days, they were flushed by the by the rain. It took anywhere from as short as three days to three weeks. That was it. And again, they're anadromous fish, unlike your fish here that are always freshwater fish. These fish were changing. They were going from uh, a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish. And that 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 change was something that they have no control over. Okay? And so it just occurred, and, and by the time they're in the ocean, they were they were salt they were with the salt water. So the problem we have now is with these dams, the four lower snake dams, that time went from shortest at three weeks to three months or never. And a lot of these fish never were able to, to get beyond the, the, some of the dams. So again, if they don't get beyond the dams to the ocean, they're not coming back. So that's where the, the problem started, was the out-migration, uh, not so much the, again, that it was coming back. So one of the brilliant ideas they had was to barge the fish down. So what they would do is literally collect all the different run fish that were coming down, and they put them in barges and go from dam to dam to dam, to lock to lock to lock to the ocean. And they would get to the ocean, and they would dump out the fish, and, and they'd feed them alive, a lot of them. But the problem is, you know, fish have a brain, you know, tiny. So their stress level is pretty high. And so they're getting beat up in, this, in these barges. Their scales are falling off. They're getting all kinds of diseases. Uh, so even though they were letting, again, a relatively small number of fish, they were feeling good. Oh, we just let 10,000 smolts go. Well, those smolts were just garbage. They were lit, you know, walking dead, basically. And, and the survival on those was just poor. But we felt good about it. And we're still doing this today, still collecting these fish, putting them in, in these barges, and shipping them to the ocean. Uh, another thing that happened along the way is we reduced the flow, so we created the, the reservoirs behind the dams. Because again, we don't want to dump the water until we're going to make money generating. And so one thing that happened was uh, it changed the way the fish had to live. You know, in the old days, like I said, they flushed the ocean backwards. They didn't even swim there. Now there's no current. They're having to literally swim to the ocean because of the way they're designed with their, their, their bladders and that. They're floating in the top three feet of the water. So they're very susceptible now to predators as far as avian and fish. And one thing that was created by the, the reservoirs was that a native fish that was once upon a time called the squawfish, but now it was changed to the northern pike minnow, uh, was, was, was labeled as the bad guy because those fish were, were predatory. Their numbers did increase because of the slow water. And so even today, you can see you know, there's a, a northern pike minnow. But when I was up there, it was the squawfish program. Squawfish Bounty, now it's the Sport Reward Program. And we're not we're talking a few bucks here. This guy back in 2010 made $81,000 by catching squawfish. Again, that's kind of a band aid on the whole problem, but it's, it's part of that. Yeah, we're doing something to help the, 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 the salmon by we're, we're killing the pike minnows. Well, you know, like I say, it's a feel good. These guys, you know, these folks made money, but in reality, it, it, it wasn't reducing you know, the problem. Those fish weren't going to make it to the ocean anyway unless they were spilled over the top. And there's been times when we were allowed to do spills and we found out that again with coated wire tags and all kinds of stuff, pit tags, that when those fish came back, I mean you know when those fish started coming back, we the, the rates were good depending on whether it was a you know a sockeye or, or a steelhead how many years it was going to spend in the ocean. So we know that if they get there, they're going to come back. But you have to throw a lot of fish at it, even uh, with that as far as hatchery fish, and, and you, know, you start getting those production costs and limits. And, and then, uh, what's you know, uh, the competition now is a big thing with folks saying, you know, what were few remaining wild fish are there, the habitat is, is the food sources are being competed by with the hatcheries, and so there's lawsuits to stop the hatcheries, even right now. Just some give you a little view on Idaho's. Uh, um, Kind of way of dealing with resources. This is this is from a long time ago. This is back when when uh, when uh, Dirk Kempthorne became was our governor. And this fellow here is Larry Craig. Does anybody remember the name Larry Craig? Does anybody remember a congressman in the bathroom in Minneapolis? Mm -hmm. Big uh, it, was, it, was, it was big news, especially in Idaho. And this is kind of funny because this cartoon was made uh, like ten years before he got caught in the bathroom, and so. The, this joke about the sucking sound because all this money that was being dumped in Corps of Engineer projects wasn't helping the salmon. And, 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 uh, and then in Idaho, we had two really what we call our, our stars of conservation, our spring churches and salamanders. And these guys were doing a pretty 
poor job of, of just keeping on the tradition. Also, we had a congresswoman named Helen Chenoweth, and her whole rationale for uh, uh, for not dealing with, uh, with the inanimate prom was that I can go to the store and buy a can of salmon off the shelf. So what's the problem? <laughs> um, and uh, one of our uh, fellow, I don't know if Kevin knew him, but uh, after she kept shooting her mouth off in, 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 uh, in, in the press, one of our, our national fish managers said, you know, that's very poor information she's providing. Well, soon after this, Dexter was no longer our fish manager. <laughs> he was trans, uh, transferred to be a regional manager as far away from the ocean as he could get. Um, but he was right. She was just saying all kinds of whack stuff that people love to hear there. And, uh, and the problem was it was uh, it made people think that there wasn't a problem. There really was. The other thing I mentioned is that these dams are there for uh, have locks for barge traffic. And Lewiston, Idaho, has the claim to being the farthest inland port in America, the farthest uh, Pacific port, inland port in, in, in the United States. And so we have these barges that come up uh, all the way from the Pacific to Lewiston, even though there's train tracks that are right next to it. So it's a whole thing about being able to say that you're in the port and uh, all that kind of stuff. But the cost, again, of the salmon is just poor when it comes to those dams and, and the value of what's being trans, transported down the river. Um, again, we had a, a Ken Thorne was before he was Secretary of Interior, who was our governor. And if you wanted to get Dirk out somewhere in public, you brought a camera and sand, and Dirk was there. They're just showing um, uh, with doing this thing. And later on, it was a joke um, when, when Dirk was a uh, Secretary of Interior. You know, Secretary of the Interior is a lot of different departments in there. And so when I would go anywhere with my family, we would fly, you know, this game, look where's Waldo. We would look for where's Dirk. Because you could always go and look in the brochure at a, anywhere that's related to the Department of Interior. And there would be Dirk there wearing the uniform of whatever the agency was, just for the photo line. And did a lot for himself, but didn't do a heck of a lot for the fish. And like I say, we built all these really cool kind of bypass or you know fish ladders for coming back. But the problem was there's literally nothing going up those things. And and even to this day, there's people that I know whose job was to sit at the top of the ladder where it channels down to a window this big, and there's a camera there in case they fall asleep, where they're literally watching for a fish to come by and count that fish or that's how few the returns were. And so again, we threw all kinds of hatcheries at them. Um, and this is our Eagle Hatchery, which is where Kevin, you live in Eagle, didn't you? Oh, I live in Napa. Napa, okay. Close. 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 You know, every 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 wild fish that would come back would be brought here, it would be ultrasounded, each egg literally was counted, and, and the genetics worked out trying to, to spread as, as thin uh, out as you could. Very few salmon genes we had coming back, whether it was Chinook or, uh, or sockeye or even uh, steelhead. And so, again, we've been working on all these different aspects of the 4 H problems, 4 H solutions. And right now, when it comes to the salmon in the Pacific Northwest, there's miles and miles and miles of prime spawning habitat just waiting for salmon to come. So, it's not that all those problems that we've had in the past with things like uh, the Yankee Fork and the Dredge, those things have all been taken care of. It's not that there's not a place for those fish to go if they would get there, it's just that there's no fish to get there. There are some ocean problems that are out there, but again, the numbers are something you've got sufficient numbers. Predation is, is again it, somewhat of an issue, but the real issue is the hydro and whether you can have those dams or not. And there's been a push for a long time to do something about that. And so when you start looking at the numbers, again, very little percent of the, the energy that comes from there is significant, two to four percent. Uh, we have the, the, again, the shipping to the locks there that makes them feel good. Uh, Fourteen farms, these, are, these aren't like mom and pop farms, these are like corporate, you know, farms. They're, they draw the water from that, and again, there is no flood control. And uh, like I mentioned, Kevin, that I borrowed the slide from a friend of ours, and there's that uh, they can't know what they're eating of, you know. Uh, this guy was uh, the lead guy that uh, did a natural story for Idaho, and um, he got to the point where he worked for Kevin in the Nature Center because he couldn't handle the salmon world anymore. It was so frustrating. You know, and, uh, his heart was all for salmon. And so the bottom line are these those four dams. And 
And when you start to look again at what the, all the cumulative effect of those dams has been, is that you know, these are some of our various runs of Chinook and Steelhead and Sockeye back like just last year and two years ago, now the last number we have, nine wild fish came back. And then another, uh, what, uh, 58 fish came back that were natural. All that meant was that those fish spawned naturally, but their genetics were from hatchery fish. So out of all uh, of those fish, you know, 67, uh, and the rest of anything else came back was, was, was a hatchery fish. And so what you start to see is that it, and risk those hatchery fish are all, again, very related to these fish genetically. So many, you know, these, new, these genes are going to be incorporated into that, just like these were in here before. But again, if you're talking fish that are back by millions, now coming back by barely double digit numbers. And so when you think of the genetic diversity that's not there, the risk for the disease or other kind of things that would occur, uh, or genetic mutation, it's horrible. So again, we're Throwing millions and millions of, of, of smolts at the problem, uh, but at the same time, it's, we're ignoring the real cause of the problem, which is, is the dams. And we start to look at the goals, and we say five percent of the historic average, you know, work, you know, hoping to get back, you know, <coughs> that's the goal. We're barely getting, you know, any, you know percent there. That small goal we want. So the bottom line is. Charts are all doing this. It's all a decline. My personal opinion, my, again, I'm very biased, is that we're just ignoring it long enough so we can say, oh, we meant to see the salmon, we didn't see the salmon. And, uh, and so um, when, I, when people would come to me, like last year before I retired, say, hey, do you have a pamphlet on, on salmon issues? The last pamphlet I could give to them was one that was created 35 years ago, back when Cecil Anderson was Nothing from any of the administrations since then had bothered to address the same issue. So, and since that time, there have been we're over five stars, five claims, five rejections, five rejections, and so 16 million spent, no success. And so, again, you start to follow the spiral on those charts, it's, it's a death spiral. And that's the bad news is that we made the point where, as far as these from a wild, natural fish standpoint, they're going to be gone. Be just as many hatchery fish as we can throw at it, but again, with uh, limited genetics and uh, all because of these four lower snake dams that really benefit relatively few people uh, when you look at the overall importance of salmon in, in the ecosystem there. And there is some talk of again reaching, reaching the dams. Um, right now, the bigger driver is that uh, the orcas feed on the salmon as they come back, as they're coming back, and without, of course. Uh, with the salmon going down. So without the salmon going down, the orcas are, are, are starting to drop off in numbers as well. And we start to go back to things like charismatic megafauna. You know, what's going to draw your attention more, an orca or a sockeye? You know, uh, it's just like you know, we, we, we listed the, the wolf and the bear because those are things that people could you know, relate to. You know, there's other critters that were just probably as important, but they weren't nearly as charismatic. So if anything happens for the dams and breaching, it's going to be because I think of the orca because of the draw it has versus the uh, salmon. But people are trying, and uh, they're, they say, but not enough people understand the issue or are willing to do it nothing about it. Uh, there are definitely concerned folks, but in the end, I, you know, so far, they like say it's been a slow motion kind of extinction, and it's happening right before our eyes, and before we know it, they're going to be gone, and we're going to say, gee, we met the solid. And, and you know, start talking about the peaceful species and uh, you know, the salmon are it. They were the people once upon a time, uh, and they, they still are in a way. They definitely were from the So, um, you know, it's, it's that, you know, like Leopold said, that intelligent tinkering. You know, you don't throw away something. And in this case, we might end up throwing away or slow motion process, we throw away a real key player in any. So I wish I had good news, but I don't. <laughs> uh, and that's maybe to help you spur you guys on to thinking about that. That uh, you know, there could come a day when we don't have any wild salmon left in the Pacific Northwest, which is again the icon. You know, when you think of the Pacific Northwest, you think of the salmon. That's what it's about. And so uh, our salmon river in Idaho doesn't have salmon. Mm -hmm. you know, or 
redfish lake barely has any redfish in it. So those are names that were given for a reason. Now they might just be names. So that's a, an overview on Pacific Northwest, the role of salmon, uh, what we did to try to, 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 to exploit it, and what we tried to do to, to replace it. But in the end, again, the numbers are not promising. And what we're going to do here in a second is go do an activity that's called Hooks and Ladders. And in this activity, we get the chance to uh, recreate what happened to salmon from the Niagara from the standpoint, as far as going from spawning ocean and then back again. So most of the people in the room that, that are going to be in this activity are going to be smolts or salmon. They sort of grow up to that. Uh, and then some of the other folks will play some other aspects of the, of the, of the, uh, of the life cycle. But for the most part, we're all going to be smolts. So let's head around the corner here. You don't need paper or pencil. Hey Tracy. Yeah. 